Okay. All right. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is lecture nine. We're going to talk more, more, more specifically about chemokines and chemo attraction and recruitment. This gets kind of more into that uh, monocyte neutrophil recruitment. We've hinted at some of it. I wanted to take you through it kind of step by step. And I don't know um, what I plan to do on Thursday. Um, I built in an extra day just so that, uh, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, with, with the lecturing on Zoom and all that, if I would need extra time. So I built in an extra day. Thursday, we may, depending on what, what go, how it goes today, Thursday may not, Thursday may just be an open day. We just don't have class. I'll let you know. There's stuff I can lecture on, but I don't know. I think, I think we've had nine good lectures and there's plenty of material uh, for the first part of the course. And then of course, the uh, second part of the course will be the applied terminology. So the idea here is that I've given you enough of a basis that now we can read some papers and we can listen to some experts in the field and that we'll get some, you know, have a good idea what's happening in their research program. Um, so yeah. I said this pre-recording, but we do have a test next Thursday. We have a review period on Tuesday. Make sure if you have questions, bring it to, to us or bring it to me on Tuesday. Um, and, you know, like I said, if you have to make alternate or alternate arrangements for the test, let's do that ahead of time, not after. Um, okay. So I want to talk about this this idea of chemo attraction. So chemo attraction involves things, something called a chemokine, which I'll explain, selectins, integrins, major quintile proteases. Um, mostly we see recruitment into the brain and spinal cord with injury, autoimmune disease, um, CNS, in, CNS infection. So it's this, what I'll talk about today, this, this recruitment of cells is, is not really what's happening in the in the healthy brain and spinal cord. And, you know, obviously the, the immune system is being recruited for a purpose. And so there's, there's, it's not just always a negative response, but, you know, we've talked about this in class before that with the level of inflammation that can, can occur when you start bringing the immune system into the brain, uh, you can get, uh, you know, collateral damage and collateral damage to, to oligos and neurons um, is generally, uh, not the best, right? So, okay. So we've talked about this before, you know, this, this idea of the central nervous system being immune privileged site or, you know, immunologically specialized site. And I think it's better to think of it as sort of this immunologically specialized site. You know, we know it's really not immune privileged per se. Um, Cytokines and chemokines, you know, we've talked about these already, these, these small biological signaling molecules used for cell-cell communication. They're throughout the body. They signal through surface receptors and they have a number of different functions. Um, chemokines are small molecules, about 60 to 100 amino acids, low, low molecular weight, eight to 14 kilodaltons. They're really the largest family of cytokines and I'll show you sort of the big diversity in in, uh, in chemokines in the next few slides. They're structurally related and I'll kind of show you a little bit how it is. Um, and they're structurally conserved with these cysteine residues um, as part of their amino acid sequence. And there's basically four characteristic sort of cysteine sequences that you see with these chemokines. So what chemokines do is they attract cells. So chemo attraction is, is you know, attracting cells and uh, they'll do it in the context of infection, injury, uh, they're released by immune cells, but they can be released by some other cells too. Um, certainly some evidence like astrocyte will release certain chemokines. Um, we see that chemokines, you know, will also help, you know, bring in monocytes, neutrophils, T cells into the brain or spinal cord. What you also need for recruitment is the slowing down of immune cells. Cause remember they're in the bloodstream. So they're flowing through the blood. So you have to slow them down. And that's where these integrins and selectins come in to play. And these, this is gonna be at the blood brain barrier at the endothelial cells. 
So chemokines will also sort of enhance the or increase the expression of, of integrins and selectins. I'll show you that. Um, there's really two main classes of these chemokine ligands and ligand receptors, the cysteine cysteine or CXC. Uh, so cysteine X cysteine. Does anyone know or guess what the X stands for? Is X an amino acid or is X something else? I helped my daughter last night with algebra. So you know, trying to kind of reduce the equation here. What, what does X stand for? I think it is any amino acid. Correct. Yeah. So the cysteine, the C stands for cysteine and the X means it can be any. So that's kind of giving you the, the X is like kind of variable, right? But the cysteine, the cysteine pattern stays the same. So it could be cysteine, tyrosine, cysteine, cysteine, serine, cysteine, you know, it can be a lot of different chemokines, it can be any of them, or any, any amino acid. So um, they usually bind each other. So, so like, for example, now this gets a little bit confusing because um, immunology initially started calling everything interleukins and then realizing some of, the some of these things are actually chemokines. So for example, IL-8, interleukin-8 is a very strong chemokine. It's also called CXCL8, and it activates CXCR1 on neutrophils. So you have this chemokine uh, binding receptor and the chemokine itself. And you, we saw this before. Everyone remember that CNS cytokine that has a microglia, microglia neuron connection? Everyone remember that one? CX3. Yeah, please. Somebody. CX3, CL1. Yeah, so fractalkine, right? So that's one that we've, that, that has sort of that same, it's CX3, right? So there's three Xs, uh, C, cysteine again. Okay, so that's sort of the, the receptor and the pairing of those. Um, so these, these are the different types. Um, and so let's take a look here. These are the different receptors up top here. Um, and so they're again, defined by the number and spacing of conserved cysteine residues in their amino termini. So it's going to be this, there's basically four. It can be that CXC, CCC, or CX3C. So this is this, this example will be what fratokine is. So, um, Another ones would be, um, uh, so these, these are the, the, the ligands here and the receptors. So the, the, the ligands here um, come in this, this denotation. So you have like CXCL1, CXCL2, and so on, all right? Then over here you have CCL. So this is the cysteine, cysteine ligand one. Um, so there would be like CCL2 will be in here. Um, and so the, the, the part about it too is this pleiotropy, right? Where you have all these different chemokines that can bind uh, the same receptor. So let's take a look up top here. You see that the CXCR1 receptor here, you know, there's two different chemokines, CXCL8 and, and CXCL6 that bind to it. Six, CXCR2, which is a big one. This is a, a big chemokine receptor. You find a lot of uh, monocytes and neutrophils. You have C, I mean, eight different chemokines that, that bind to it. So for those of you, you know, planning experiments and saying, well, I think this, you know, CXCO1 is really important in my, my model. And if I delete, or if I knock this out, um, the effect's gonna go away. Problem with knocking out one chemokine, as you can see, is that there's a lot of different ones that can do a similar thing. So a lot of what's called redundancy, right? Where you have a lot of this chemokines can bind a similar receptor. So you see, I think hopefully you can see is that there's, it's just not a one-to-one -one relationship with the ligand and the receptor. In some cases that's, that, that might be true, but for a lot of them, move my face out of the way. For a lot of them, you can see that, there, that there's multiple partners. So the CXC classification is, is one of the most common ones and then CC is the second most common. So you see uh, these. 
And then this is this would be an example here of the the CX3C. So this would be an example more like the fratacon receptor. And if any of you guys do um, like a inflammatory arrays or something, like if you do uh, sequencing or nanostring for inflammatory markers, and you're doing an inflammatory condition, you can see a ton of these different uh, chemokine ligands in the brain or spinal cord. So um, the receptors are these uh, serpentine receptors. Uh, you can see here in A, uh, what that means is they cross the membrane here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. So they go, they go in and out, in and out. And they're, they're G protein linked as you guys have maybe learned about G proteins in some other class. Uh, G proteins are a way that you know the cell signals through from the receptor to the nucleus. There's activator G proteins and there's inhibitor G proteins. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, this is a little bit variable, but the receptors when bound to a chemokine are internalized. Um, and one of the ideas is that the reason this complex is internalized is that so you get desensitization. So you 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 get the message. Uh, you buy, let's say you're, it's, this is the CCR2 receptor and you get CCL2, you bind it, you internalize it, you receive the signal, um, you know, it activates the cell, it wants to go into the tissue, uh, but you, you internalize the receptor so you're not keeping receiving that same signal. So a little bit about, a little bit more about it, this is from um, an immunology textbook. Um, just looking at the different chemokine uh, partners. And so, again, these are immune, you know, modulators. Um, a confusing part too, uh, with this classification of chemokines, they have old names too. So before this CCL and CXCL classification, they were called other things. So if you have done RNA sequencing or you've done nanostring or something where you're looking at a whole bunch of genes and sometimes they'll show up as you know, under the chemokine classification or sometimes they'll show up as, as other things. Um, and actually, you know, I, th I think you can kind of learn more from the old names because it, you, it, it, you know, in, the, in the name, it kind of gave the function, um, but we have to go with the new names now. So. What I want to show you is that you don't have to know all these things, but just to show you kind of how some of these things work. So something like CCL3 is produced by you know, monocytes, T cells, mast cells, and fibroblasts. It can use three different receptors, receptor one, receptor three, receptor five, what, who it attracts, monocytes, natural killer cells, basophils, dendritic cells, um, and so, what function it has, it you know, depends on the situation, but mostly you're going to see these things in the context of injury or infection, calling cells to, to sites of injury. So this MIP1-alpha is actually macrophage inhibitory um, protein, 1-alpha, which is weird because it actually attracts cells. Um, and then CCL4 is this macrophage inhibitory protein 1-beta. Um, and so on. So they, they have these different names. You can look at these. We don't have to go through them, babble on about them. But mostly it shows you that you have the chemokine, you have these different receptors. Most of them bind multiple receptors and they can attract multiple different types of cells. This is the CXC uh, domain. Um, these are, uh, again, same idea. You have the ligand. It's produced by a number of immune cells. It uses multiple receptors and attracts um, other immune cells. So CXCL8, for example, is called IL-8. This is a big chemoattractant factor for neutrophils. So oftentimes, if you're talking about wound healing or injury infection, when we've talked about neutrophils being that first line of defense, often, you know, really acutely, you'll see very high levels of IL-8. Um, in humans and, and in rodents. Um, some of these chemokines are specialized in certain cells like 
CXCL7 is made by platelets and tracks neutrophils. Um, and this one has one ligand, one receptor, uh, and so on. Let's see. Okay. But again, I'm not going to ask you specific. I'll ask you what a chemokine does, but I'm not going to ask you so much about, uh, you know, what all the different pairings mean. Um, this is uh, some more kind of, I give you some examples from an immunology textbook. Here's from a review article, uh, in immunology one. And this is more focused on where we see these chemokine interactions more in the context of neuroimmunology. So, you know, if we want to recruit monocytes, it's often through the CCR1, CCR5 receptors, um, also CCR2 receptors. If you want to recruit uh, T lymphocytes, you see CCR2, CCR5, CC, CCR5, um, CXCR3, and so on. So the, the, the different receptors on these cells will bind to different ligands, you know, made by um, you know, immune cells or microglia or, or astrocytes. And if you look here in the comments, you, you see this, you know, when they're being recruited. So like I've told you, or I've told you a few times, and you see it in autoimmune disease, you see it in host defense against CNS viruses, you see it with injury. Uh, and and um, this is probably, you know, kind of the best examples. And these are examples that we'll go through as part of the applied class. Okay, so just a little bit on the chemokine ligand receptors in, in, in viruses and disease pathology. Sometimes viruses can use uh, these chemokine receptors to get into cells. So HIV, for example, uh, there is a cognitive component HIV and HIV can get into cells, uh, monocytes using CCR5, uh, can also get into to microglia. So you can, get, you can get HIV infection in the CNS. Um, HIV gets into, can use a couple different receptors to hijack. But again, if you have surveying monocytes and they come into the brain, um, they can be carrying HIV inside of them. Um, we know that there's a, a lot of key chemokine receptor interactions that, that bring in immune cells during uh, viral infection. So we know we bring in T cells and, and monocytes for, for viral infections. Um, and we'll go through a couple of these examples. Uh, CXCR3 uh, can recruit C4 cells in the context of herpes simplex virus and West Nile virus, which was uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit older now, but I'm, I, there was a, at some point a few years ago, West Nile virus, you know, was in, in Ohio and people were worried about that. Uh, West Nile virus can get into the brain and it can have, uh, uses the CXCL10 to recruit CD8 cells into the brain. Um, and if you remember, I've kind of hinted at this before, but West Nile virus, you'll actually see, you know, viral or CD8 mediated destruction of neurons in that example. Um, and there is some protection. So a lot of times when you start messing with these chemokines um, and chemokine ligands, sometimes it makes things worse because what the immune cells are doing is, is you know, containing the infection. So if you prevent them from getting there, sometimes it makes things worse. And that's what happens if you uh, reduce CXCL10 in uh, West Nile virus. When we talk about uh, multiple sclerosis lesions, you see the very high CCR1, CCR5 expression on monocytes and microglia. They seem to be recruited to that the areas of, of the plaque, so to speak. This would be the areas of active you know, myelination problems where you see uh, demyelination, where you see uh, you know, active pathology. And there's actually been a lot of work when we think about Neuroimmunology and, and really the, one of the foundations of, of neuroimmunology is EAE or MS, this autoimmune disease. Um, and what, a lot of what we've learned about neuroimmunology comes from this because if you start messing with the receptors 
for chemokines, you can reduce uh, autoimmune disease because now these uh, self-reactive cells can't get into the brain. And actually some of the um, therapies for MS actually target this uh, migration. Okay, so remember that uh, leukocyte migration, we've talked about surveying T cells, is important. Um, one of the side effects of blocking all immune trafficking to the brain is that you can, be, you can succumb to these very rare CNS viruses, um, which you know, no, normally no one would ever die from because your immune system keeps them in check. But if you block all cells from getting, you know, kind of surveying the immune, the immune system, surveying the brain through those pathways we talked about in the choroid plexus and, and going through the CSF and draining out through the uh, wheel lymphatics, if you prevent that, that you can be more susceptible to some of these viruses. So this leukocyte migration is important for host defense. All right. And I think what we worry about is, is with disease or, or infection or injury when sometimes this isn't as regulated. Um, so how do cells get in? I, I know we've talked about this in a couple of different ways, but I think today we'll, we'll focus more on some of the chemokines and adhesion molecules and selectins. So remember that if you have a dam, let's say you have damage in the CNS or spinal cord and you have the cells there, the local cells producing factors that indicate there's damage and they need help. So chemokines are gonna be part of that. So they're gonna be dumping out these chemokines into the blood and you know, cells in the blood are gonna be the first responders. So you can see some you know, neutrophils. And as more immune cells get in, they're gonna be pumping out more uh, chemokines. And so remember these cells are in the blood and they have a movement to them. And so you also need to increase your ability to kind of slow them down and bring them to the site that you want to bring them to. And then in the brain, we talked about how you have to cross the blood brain barrier, which had, has a couple different key steps. And I think if you don't know what those are, know it for the exam on Thursday, next Thursday. Um, and in some of these situations, we're seeing immune cells into the parenchyma, which has its you know, additional challenges. And if the cells stay there and you don't see resolution of that inflammation, um, you see you know, neuropathology. So let's talk a little bit about integrins. So integrins are a family of transmembrane adhesion molecules that mediate cell-cell and cell extracellular matrix interactions. So these are gonna be things that cause really sort of tight binding. Um, you know, we need integrins for tissue repair, wound healing, uh, you're going to see them increase when we want to bring cells to a specific site with injury or infection. They also can be involved in, in increasing and in, in reestablishing, um, you know, blood supply or angiogenesis. Um, we see that they're involved in morphogenesis during development and tissue remodeling. We know that adhesion, these integrins are important for axon growth, synapse formation, glial differentiation, and myelination. Um, we need integrins in the immune system to generate uh, hemopoietic stem cells, uh, T cell maturation, lymphocyte uh, honing, um, and sort of responses to antigen. And when we talk about hemopoietic stem cells, anybody remember where those, where you'd find those cells? I just want to see if anybody's still paying attention. Bone marrow? That's right. So your hemopoietic stem cells are in the bone marrow, right? So selectins are uh, another type of uh, adhesion molecule. These are kind of the, um, the ones that are responsible for slowing a cell down. And you'll find that, you know, that they have, they, they've been named based on their functions. So the selectins um, have lectin domains, all right, that are kind of repeated. And then they have a transmembrane domain. You can kind of see this, this here. And so, an L-selectin, the L means leukocyte, all right? So you find these, these selectins on leukocytes. Then you can find selectins on endothelial cells, so E-selectins on endothelial cells, and P, P is on platelets. So you get P-selectins. So these are the basic types of selectins and they're just based on you know, what cell type they're in. So again, if you're doing gene arrays and things and you're looking and you see a bunch of L-selectins, it's usually gonna be on an immune cell. If you see a bunch of E-selectins, it's likely going to be on your endothelial cells. 
So some of these selectins are, are constitutively expressed. You guys know what that means, right? It means it's always expressed. So L-selectin is always on monocytes. It's always on T cells. It's always on neutrophils. Um, on some of these other cell types, effector Ts, memory Ts, uh, central memory Ts, you know, we see low expression selectin. Um, E-selectin is always on skin, endothelium, uh, and generally, E-selectin is, is not expressed on, um, you know, regular endothelial cells. It, it's, it's going to be induced. So again, you know, part of the chemokine process in recruiting cells is enhancing selectins on endothelial cells. Um, we see P-selectin in the choroid plexus, constitutively um, expressed. And remember, we've talked about where is the choroid plexus? And what does it do? It borders the ventricles and it creates CSF. You cut out there. I think you were saying it, it pumps out CSF. That's correct. It's also the gateway of, of where immune cells come in to the brain, right? So it's like this magical fountain, okay? And so it would make sense, right? The choroid plexus is a place where we see active recruitment of immune cells as part of immune surveillance. So it makes sense that they, that they express selectin, right? So they have to be able to slow the cells down. Does that make sense to everybody? Expect a choroid plexus question on the exam. I'm thinking about one right now. Um, okay, so it's, you have these selectins that bind to the integrins. So you have this pairing, the selectins are on certain cell types, and then integrins are sort of in the, in the membrane. Um, we've learned about some of these integrins already. It's actually how we kind of tell some cells apart. So um, if you're paying attention, you know, CD11B is, a, is an integrin that we use to determine, you can see most Macrophages are C11B positive, monocytes and microglia are C11B positive. So this is an integrin. Um, CD11C is another integrin you generally find on dendritic cells. So these are integrins down here. There's an alpha subunit, and this is where those CDs come in. And there's a beta subunit. Does anybody remember the, what uh, CD11B and CD18 integrin, what it bound? We talked about it as sort of a modulator of inflammation. I'm just full of questions today. I think it's because of the two hours I did uh, shoveling the driveway. I'm asking questions so I can rest. Nobody? Ethan? Was it one of the T helper cells? It is fibrinogen. So CD11B and CD18 form that complex that bound fibrinogen, right? And so fibrinogen was that something that's coming in from the blood into the sort of the um, CVOs. And, and we're seeing this sort of you know, profound activation of microglial fibrinogen. But anyway, so integrins have a, a lot of different purposes. We've seen some of these, whether you recognize or not, we've seen some integrins before. I just didn't tell you that they were integrins. Then uh, we have sort of the, the stronger binding capacity called the immunoglobulins. Um, and these are gonna be you know, really strong adhesion molecules. So uh, you're gonna see things like ICAM-1, ICAM-2, ICAM-3, VCAM, but the V is generally for uh, vascular. And then um, PCAM, which is gonna be on um, platelets, and then ICAM is, is generally, they are, the I is for inducible. So again, under inflammatory conditions, a lot of these things are increased or inducible. So the selectins have these you know, weak bonds. Um, it's almost like, you know, if you're rolling a ball on the grass, right? And the grass is slowing it down. There's no, there's no bond of the grass to the ball. It's just slowing it down because it gets that kind of caught up in the gra grass. And so think of selectins more like the kind of, you know, grassy hairs that slow something down. 
And that's what selectins do. So integrins have this, you know, selectins then bind to integrins, which have the stronger bond. Um, they get this rolling action. So the, the selectins and integrins will kind of, you know, this is more like Velcro kind of connection where you're starting to get it to, to stop. So you're, you're getting from the cell from slowing down to a stop or to an, you know, the, the correct term is arrest. Oops, is that everything? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, this selectin integrin interaction. Um, and, you know, we see that they, you know, are on certain cell types. L-selectin again on leukocytes, P-selectin on endothelial, sorry, endothelial cells and platelets, and E-selectin on endothelial cells. So um, if any of you guys have done uh, flow cytometry, you probably will use CD62 or CD34 looking for uh, certain selectins. The alpha integrins um, are here. So this is the beta one integrin. It's this complex of CD49D and CD29, also known as VLA4. And its major ligand is VCAM. So these integrins bind to the uh, immunoglobulins uh, also called uh, fibronectin. So VLA4, you've probably heard about. There's a lot of um, drugs that target VLA4. Um, and then you see a lot of, you know, vascular adhesion is through uh, VCAM1. And again, I'm sure if you've done any arrays within sort of the immune system, you've seen these things before. Um, the, the beta-2 integrins, again, have a lot of different functions, but uh, one that we've talked about a little bit is that um, you know, CD11B, CD18, MAC1 receptor. Uh, we've also, we also see this CD11A, CD18 complex on leukocytes, which binds to ICAM1. So again, I'm not gonna ask you all the different complex things, but I would like you to know the basic definition of, of some of these, these things and, and what, they, what they bind to. Um, this is just showing you some of the structure of these uh, beta two and beta one integrins. There's a you know a number of different classes of them. Um, they form these AB heterodimers. I think there's twenty something of these. Yep, yep, twenty two. And there's three classes: beta one, beta two, and alpha, beta. This is what they look like. Um, so these integrins uh, are like anchors. So not only do they have this, you know, in extracellular component, um, right? And so this, this is showing you integrins that are bound to an extracellular matrix. So this is the extracellular matrix. These are the integrins here, and then they're anchored to the cell. So um, think of it as, I don't know, what, what's a good example here? Boat mooring, maybe, you know how you have, you put an anchor down, you anchor it into, into the, you cement it into the, into the uh, floor of the water. Um, and then you have a long chain, right? That comes out from the water and hooks up to your boat. Um, and so the idea here is that if you're pulling on the cell, right? That it, the cell itself is, is structurally anchored so that it doesn't just rip the cell apart. So inside the cell, you have this anchoring uh, with, you know, actin and tensin, and these things really keep these integrins tight and in place. Um, unlike those selectins we talked about that are kind of like the leaves of grass that things just kind of roll through, these, these integrins really are anchors. So you can, you can imagine that you can have this really tight binding. Um, tight binding and adherence. So the outside, this is the alpha beta heterodimer. Inside the cytoplasm, we have these anchors. And so when, when something binds here, it actually sends signals um, that actually goes sort of this, 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 what's called outside in, inside out signaling. So their signals start from the outside 
So you'll get a signal through this extruder domain. It'll come inside and then the inside will respond and come back out. So it's a unique sort of signaling setup for these integrins. Okay. Um, this is showing you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple different examples of selectins. So uh, an adhesion molecule. So this is that, that rolling that I talked about. So this is gonna be mediated initially by these selectins. We're gonna have, um, you know, the adhesion molecules here, the, the integrins on the surface of the endothelial cells. And we're going to slow these cells down till we get adhesion and arrest. And once we get those cells arrested at one of the sites, we can then get that trans endothelial cell extravascation. And what this word means just is when it's going through here. So to go through this, this space, it usually goes between the two endothelial cells into, from that tight junction. And where does it end up? When it goes into the brain or spinal cord, it goes into the perivascular space to start. And then if it has to go through the glial imitin, um, then it needs to use what, what sort of enzymes needed to get through the glial limitin? Matrix metalloproteases. That's right. Okay. This is the same, same example. We've shown this before. This is right out of the immunology textbook. I really like this textbook. I, I like all the versions of it, and I think they do a nice job of, of the picture. So you can see not only the, the immune cell, but you also can kind of see the, the shapes. So we see that um, this, this looks like a neutrophil here. And we have, remember we talked about the chemokine receptor. So this neutrophil is, ex, is, is expressing uh, the CXCL8 receptor. So the, um, it's gonna bind IL-8. Um, you're gonna have the, the ligand produced here right there. Um, and so it's going to attract the cell and it's going to stop. These are the uh, selectins. It's going to start cause that rolling. And as it's rolling, then we get these adhesion molecules. So these are interactions between, um, you know, the immunoglobulin here with the integrin. So the integrin here is on the cell. Uh, this is one of the complexes we talk, talked about. It. This is a, a you know, beta two integrin binds to ICAM. And so now you get this tight adhesion. So now we get this arrest of the cell. Now it can follow that chemokine gradient uh, and push its way through in between the cells. Um, and then, you know, go to, you know, keep following this chemokine gradient uh, to find the areas of, of damage or infection. So the vascular adhesion generally uses these, these uh, immunoglobulins. This is ICAM-1. It binds to the uh, integrin. So this is just going through some of the other chemokine examples, but this is the basic basic steps. This this here is just showing you the selectin, um, and so the selectins are going to be on the immune cell. So this again is a neutrophil, which has L selectin, and then the E selectin is going to be on an endothelial cell. So this these selectins here kind of cause that transient bonding, binding. And so as the neutrophil is flowing down through the bloodstream, it's, it's, it's hitting against the, the, the selectins and it's slowing it down. This adhesion is, is weak and transient and would be insufficient to pull a cell into, into, through the membrane. Um, and that's where the, the integrins and immunoglobulins come in. So selectins bind to selectins, and then um, the adhesion molecules, the integrins bind to immunoglobulins. Uh, this is another example of showing the rolling, the activation through chemokines, the adherence. You can see sort of the structural changes in that immune cell, and then extravasation is when it goes through there. Um, and then you see that their you know, cell is activated by whatever is causing the inflammation. The cell here, this, this recruited leukocyte is going to be producing more chemokines, attract more cells, um, and uh, you see it's sort of slowly fully activated. Now, this picture here uh, is nice and showing things crossing uh, through a barrier, but doesn't show you the uh, crossing through the perivascular space, just FYI. 
So endothelial cells, again, more examples of rolling. Um, so the, the initial part is this tethering. It's going to be select and mediated. Hopefully I've hammered that over your heads. So the, the tethering is going to be on selectins on T cells and selectins on endothelial cells. Then you're going to have this tight, tighter adhesion, which is going to be mediated by the integrins on the cell and the immunoglobins on the endothelial cell. So integrins on the immune cell, the immunoglobins on the endothelial cell. The chemotractants not only attract but also will activate the cell. So you're going to see that, for example, if we went back to the neutrophils, if this is IL-8, activates the neutrophils, it's going to be searching to kind of push itself through here. And again, in order to do that, it needs a, this tight interaction with the adhesion molecules. Um, it could be a different subset of adhesion molecules, but then it's going to sort of push its way through. Um, so this is some, some two photon imaging of immune cells coming in the brain. And I think what, what uh, they basically show is that if you affect, uh, and here they use antibodies against selectins. If you start uh, messing with the selectins, you can't slow cells down, or you start messing with the integrins, you don't get a leukocyte recruitment. And so this is a pretty old paper. Uh, and it's not super surprising, right? If, you, if you're trying to recruit immune cells and you interfere with that pathway, uh, there's less of it. Okay, so some factors to consider, you know, this, how fast the blood's moving and shearing, right? So if you high blood flow in areas, you're gonna, you know, obviously it's gonna be hard for the, the cells to adhere. Um, you also have these uh, electrostatic interactions. Um, you have this net negative charge in endothelial and inflammatory cells. Um, and so what, you, what you're actually hoping for um, is that you're going to have repulsion of, of immune cells. So you really don't want immune cells like always going into the brain and spinal cord, right? So you actually have this net negative charge. So you have this electrostatic kind of um, repulsion. So if the endothelia is negatively charged and the leukocytes negatively charged, there's no sort of slowing down or interaction. Um, but we see these, these dynamics certainly change if you actively want to recruit a cell. So again, it's sort of this intrinsic idea where you don't want um, immune cells there. And also in areas that, that where you see a lot more immune cell recruitment uh, have these high endothelial venues. Um, and these are areas that, you know, will really uh, are beneficial in recruiting cells. So these high endothelial venues, just in terms of anatomy, are not present in the CNS. So again, you don't really want to be bringing in leukocytes and neutrophils normally. But you will see them in the lymph node, right? So you have cells that home to the lymph node. You want to be able to capture them there. You have cells that home into these pairs patches. So, um, you know, they have thick basal lamina. They have this paravascular sheath. Um, they, have, they have, you know, very high expression of adhesion molecules like um, VCAM, uh, whereas, you know, normal venues will have very low uh, VCAM and ICAM. So there are areas in the body that, that do recruit immune cells and they're, they're, the capillaries here are specialized, but in the brain, we don't have those. We've seen this picture before um, in a couple different ways in that the cells have to go through the blood, through that first layer uh, of the blood vessel into the or it has to go through two layers of blood vessel into getting into the, the paravascular space um, and then has to get through this, this gliolimitin, which is green in this picture. And, you know, I re, I've told you guys this lots of different times, but just because you can get into the, into the paravascular space does not mean that you're actually getting in, into the brain parenchyma. And, and really the main barrier for that is the gliolimitin. So in order to, to get through there, you really need, you know, enzymatic reaction, 
someone told us in class, I think it, it, it may have been uh, Isabella or maybe Michaela, Michaela told us that you need um, matrix metal proteases to get through. And then once an immune cell gets through, it's, it's looking for sort of re-stimulization, seeing that signal again, once it passes through this barrier. Okay. So again, a lot of, uh, a lot of what we know about neuroimmunology comes from studies of, of MS, which is an autoimmune disease, which uh, Amy Lovett-Racky will be here soon to tell us about, I think in a week or two weeks or so. Um, and you can model MS in mice using what's called EAE, which is an autoimmune disorder, uh, where you can use T cells, autoreactive T cells to cause a demyelination event. So a lot of what we understand about um, neuroimmunology again comes from this. And so if we wanna look at, learn more about how cells are recruited to the brain, uh, this is a really good example. So let me go through this diagram for you step-by-step step to maybe, or hopefully put this, put this in context. So we're gonna have a self reaction against myelin basic protein. And remember, we had kind of talked about how it's likely these paravascular macrophages, which are in that paravascular space, that will be pre presenting self antigen. And we think the microglia also have a role in this. So both of them, for whatever reason, are expressing self antigen. So we're going to see that there is chemokine secretion. In this case, we're going to talk about CCL5 which is going to recruit T cells. So we're gonna have these microglia and, and macrophages making CCL5. This is gonna enhance the E and P selectin on the endothelial cells. Um, so it's gonna be sort of this initial kind of slowing down with E and P selectin, and they're gonna be following this gradient of CCL5. The chemokine is important because it's telling the cell that there's something going on, right? So it's going to, change the signal transduction with inside the cell. Uh, we're gonna see the enhancement of a number of these adhesion molecules. And so now we're gonna create the environment that we normally don't have uh, to really facilitate recruitment of cells. And we could, you could sub out this autoimmune disorder. You could sub it out for infection or injury, but any sort of chemokine event is going to drive this in induction of the adhesion molecules on the cell types and on the endothelial cells. Okay, so this, what this one shows you is that the selectins here, you have selectins on the immune cell, you have selectins on the endothelial cells, okay? And you're gonna have this binding, this activation of the ligand, of the chemokine ligand through the receptor. So on T cells, it's going to be the CCR receptor. So this is a CC cysteine cysteine um, chemokine, and this is a cysteine cysteine receptor. All right, so we now have this sort of interaction going on. Now we're gonna have that integrin binding. Okay, so we've slowed these T cells down. We're gonna have that integrin binding. So we're gonna have the integrins keeping these cells in place, and these are going to be, so, you know, Integrin is going to be on the T cell. I think in this case, it's going to be this alpha-4 integrin. And then the uh, VCAM1 is going to be on endothelial cells. So now you get those cells through the next level. So it goes to two layers of, of sort of this blood-brain barrier interface um, into, the, into the capillaries. And now you can get them to cross again, and it's gonna be the same interactions. It's gonna be the selectins, the uh, integrins, and the T cells are gonna get activated, right? So all these things, the integrins and the chemokine signals are gonna activate the T cell. And you're gonna see significant structural changes inside that T cell, and you'll actually see it you know, change shape and squeeze through in between endothelial cells. So in between those, those usual um, you know, tight junctions, it squeezes through. So in order to do that, I mean, the cell has to go through morphological change. And so what it's doing is it's taking in all these signals from integrins and the chemokines. So now you're getting T cells where? You're getting T cells in the paravascular space. Now, the T cells, remember, are going to respond to that antigen presenting cell. So 
So now you're going to get engine presentation. So you're going to have the engine presenting cell, which is the perivascular macrophage. It's going to bind the T cells. This is going to be a CD4 T cell. So uh, if you guys remember that tight adherence will be CD4 will bind the MHC in place. What else do we need? We need those cofactors and then we need a cytokine signal. And then uh, basically if you have a cell, once this correct cl clone comes in, the one that recognizes the cell antigen, you'll get expansion. You also get more T cells that, that come, come through and you'll get this what's called uh, reactivation uh, and re-stimulus by the microglia. So this is sort of just an overview, I think, of, of all the things I've talked about. And this is sort of the, the five things you need to get into the, the brain. And so it starts with tethering, and this is gonna be selectin-based, right? So you're gonna have selectins on endothelial cells, you're gonna have selectins on the immune cells. And there's some examples here, but probably the best way to remember is that, you know, the L selectins are on leukocytes and the E and P selectins are on endothelial cells. So this is gonna cause, you know, so sort of this rolling motion, and then you're gonna get the binding of integrins to immunoglobulins. So endothelial cells have the immunoglobulins like VCAM and ICAM, and the leukocytes have integrins like alpha-4 integrin and, and beta-2 integrins. So this is more, again, more transient adhesion, but I told you it's, it's you know, pretty anchored. And then you're going to have a rest. So the cell is going to stop. So it's no longer moving. And as it stops, it's really gonna get activated by the interaction with the adhesion molecules and the chemokines. So remember, it's following a chemokine gradient. You're gonna see changes within the cell and it stops. And now the leukocyte will change shape and this, it will transmigrate, extra vasation. This is it's going through the membrane um, and you see it change in motility. You actually see it physically squeeze between endothelial cells uh, and it, within the brain, it goes into the perivascular space. And the last step, number five, it has to overcome that glial limitin, which is made by astrocytes uh, using matrix metallic proteases. So just going back to rolling here, I, I gave you an example from, I think, 2001, but there's been a lot of studies at looking at ways to block immune cell trafficking. Um, and some of these things, you know, you can use a uh, uh, a monoclonal antibody to bind up uh, adhesion molecules so that they can't have this, this tight connection. And when you do that, uh, you, you can be very good at stopping immune cells from getting in. Uh, the initial, initial trials of, uh, of this drug, nalizotab, I think it's called, it, it, uh, it didn't pass the trials because um, people were suffering from this J virus, which is, you know, very strange, uh, obscure virus because they stopped all immune trafficking. They've since this, this, they've since reconfigured this drug a little bit. And, um, it, you know, it's one of the major drugs they use in, in MS because again, you'll have less sort of bouts of demyelination if you prevent self-reactive T cells from getting into the brain and spinal cord. But initially, uh, it's when they sort of found that you had some, some problems. Um, let's see, this is just more examples of showing, um, visualizing cells and the micro vessels moving through, showing again that it's, 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 it's alpha-4 integrin VCAM uh, dependent. And this is looking at sort of these uh, self-reactive T cells. So, um, lots of examples in MS EAE where people have, have messed with um, various stages. I gave you five stages to get an immune cell into the brain parenchyma. And if, if you disrupt these stages, we, we learned about if you, if you affect the adhesion molecules, um, you can also interfere with the matrix reptile proteases. So if you do not get those cells into the parenchyma, you have a lot less um, symptoms and again, this is a mouse model of EAE where you're causing uh, immune reactions, uh, self-immune self reactions against myelin basic protein. Matrix metal protease 7 is, is, is just one of the potential matrix metal proteases. 
Um, this is showing the anti-VLA-4. That's that natizolizab, which I'm butchering the, the uh, pronunciation of it, but it's an anti-VLA-4 antibody. Um, you see that it causes sniffing reduction of infiltrating T cells. It reduces lesion burden. And this is in humans. Um, this is uh, kind of the, what happened uh, in that trial where, where they stopped it because they developed this progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathology with sporadic causes of hemorrhage and reported several patients died. Um, they still saw, uh, they saw some, some effects of this, which they fixed for the next trials. Um, this is, I don't know how relevant this is. This just shows that in, in MS, there's monocytes in the brain, just showing you that, you know, you are getting cell recruitment there. Um, this again is, is in the model of EAE, showing that you get this recruitment of, of monocytes that don't become microglia. This is kind of a, kind of a famous, famous nature ner neurology paper, sorry, nature neuroscience paper, where they saw this active recruitment of monocytes. They did this cool parabiosis model um, to show this. Um, this is from Dory McGavran. He's done a lot of two photon imaging. Uh, he's done a lot of CNS infection. I, I bet we'll probably do his paper for the CNS infection uh, applied neurology part, um, where basically he can, he's visualized immune cells getting into the brain and, you know, looked at some of the pathology of recruitment of T cells, cool stuff. He's at the NIH. Um, let's see. So what, what you see here is that a lot of the, the pathology in the brain with CNS infection is actually caused by immune cells. You can see that uh, with CNS infections, is just a massive recruitment of immune cells that basically in his images, it looks like, you know, the, the cells basically, you know, the vessels basically explode uh, with these cells that all come in. And then if you, if you interfere with the various stages of recruitment, um, you prevent this sort of collateral damage. Uh, but in mice, so, so it's interesting because it, it's sort of this, that the uh, fabled, uh, you know, what, what is it, two-edged sword or whatever that people use all the time. But it's interesting, so if you suppress the immune cells from getting in with a CNS infection, you get you don't get that collateral damage. You don't get that massive inflammation. You don't get that um, you know rec massive recruitment of cells. But then, if if you don't get immune cells into the brain to clear the infection, guess what? The mouse dies. So it's it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't thing. So they they, they succumb to to you know all the cells in the brain get infected by the virus and then they die. So. Um, you know, there's, there's this balance between you know, wanting to clear the infection and, and not having so much collateral damage. Um, this is just, again, another uh, reminder for you. I know you've seen this before, but, but just remember that, you, that, getting through the, that getting through the brain is, is relatively, um, relatively easy, getting into the pervascular space but getting into the brain parenchyma requires a few more steps, including this matrix metalloprotease. And we learned about MPP7 a little bit in that slide, uh, but there's also a number of other ones that have been shown to be important, MPP2, MP MMP9 as well. And this should be second nature for you guys now. One thing we've talked about as well, we talked about this idea that um, fast ligand is present on neurons. Um, and when T cells get in the parenchyma, uh, they have to deal with this as well. So, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you get T cells into the brain, there is some pressure from the neurons to, to kill them. And this, this is the idea that provide neuroprotection. Um, if you, if you, uh, if you interfere with this process, you, so, so eventually I should say that you can overcome this, right? So that fast ligand one would be just, you know, just sort of your spontaneous, maybe few T cells that get into parenchyma. But I mean, once you, if you have 
infection and active recruitment, that's, you know, it's going to be easily overcome. Um, this is showing you basically survival if, so if neurons have fast ligand, they survive a lot longer with T cell inf infiltration. If you delete fast ligand on neurons, you see that they die quite quickly if there's a lot of T cells in there. But again, this is something, this is a barrier to T cells, but it's not the ultimate barrier, if that makes sense, because you do overcome it, right? So there's plenty of examples of T cells in the brain causing pathology. It's just an added barrier. And again, goes to that argument that the brain and spinal cord want to maintain that, that uh, anti-inflammatory environment. So we talked about the destructive arm of the immune system and recruitment to the brain. There may be other examples that are that sort of the exact opposite. And one of those areas is in Alzheimer's disease. And one of the ideas is that the brain actively recruits peripheral monocytes. So this is a series of papers maybe 10 years ago now, and I think it's still a pretty hot area that, that you get this recruitment of peripheral monocytes. And it's these guys, these peripheral monocytes that traffic, that get recruited around the plaque and actually dissolve the plaque. So these, these armed macrophages, uh, you know, reduce plaque load. Um, and the idea is you could use them to deliver therapeutic genes. So the, the, you can get these armed CD11B monocyte macrophages to reduce plaque loads, right? So there might be benefits to in this immune system influx and you know this is something that's that might be a good discussion topic for you guys that they're looking for a topic this this idea that you know, harnessing the immune system might be neuroprotective that you know immune cells might be involved in repair this is some work uh, that Phil Popovich has done where you have uh, you know neuro repair potentially uh, and this is sort of, I think this is the end, but the idea that, that you have uh, a, a yin and a yang of peripheral immune infiltration. So in a lot of examples I told you today are from autoimmune disease. So multiple sclerosis, this is thought to be a detrimental thing because your immune cells are attacking your myelin. Um, there are also influence of immune cells in ALS. Uh, we see neural destruction in West Nile virus. Um, but in other circumstances like Alzheimer's disease, you know, having these monocyte macrophages in the brain might help clear the plaques. So again, the ones that surround the plaques seem to be more peripheral in origin in several of these mouse examples. Um, and that, you know, in some of the disease states by changing the immune system and, you know, influencing the cells that get in, um, if you get more effector T cells in West Nile virus, you might clear the infection better without that collateral damage. And then uh, if you bring more regulatory T cells in MS or Parkinson's, you might reduce that. So there's a lot of thought about, you know, modulating the immune system, the type of cell and changing the response to have a beneficial response. And so it's that constant up and down battle. So that's all I think I wanted to talk about today. Um, it looks like I'm uh, just about at time. Does anybody have any questions on, on chemokines? So when integrins uh, form that heterodimer structure, what is the like kind of benefit to that? Does it just increase like area and help them like trap things better or? Why do they have, why do they have the alpha and the beta? Domain. Oh, sorry. I'm going back to the slide. Or I guess, yeah. So integrins, you said they, um, they form these like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The alphas and the, yeah. I think, it, I think it links the two intercellular ceiling components of the, of the two of the alpha and the beta. Um, and I think okay. it's, it's related to the cell activation and sort of tight adhesion. And, and it allows them to form these diverse heterodimers. So you can, it increases diversity when you can have heterodimers, right? So you'll see the different, you know, alpha beta together um, or alpha, alpha, uh, there's another one I'm blanking on, but you can have these different variations of that receptor. 
Sure. Thank you. Okay. So I think I've finished all the material that I wanted to uh, for this first part of the course. So um, no class on Thursday and we'll have a review session on next Tuesday and our tests will be on Thursday morning. Uh, it will require you to get onto, onto Carmen. Uh, the, the exam will be through Carmen. Uh, I, think it, I think we should probably have a, you know, get on Zoom too. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I don't know how to protect against cheating, but I guess that's how you do it. Um, so I'll lay out instructions for that as well. But I think that's the general idea is that you have to be on Zoom and take it live through Carmen. I think it'll be mostly uh, multiple choice because that probably be the simplest way to do it on Carmen. And those that you need to take the exam at a different time, make sure you tell me like now and we'll get that figured out too. I'll stop recording.